Okay, get ready because you are about to become a physicist. Did you know that? You're just about ready to become one of the top physicists in the world. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Inside the proton, the most complicated thing you could possibly imagine. Well, what is a proton? They say a proton is the, the core of a hydrogen atom, a hydrogen one atom, is one big proton. And then they have one tiny little electron surrounding it. And that proton is just one big positive. Well, now they find, well, there's quarks and there's this and there's that. And it's just very, very complicated now. Well, it is not complicated. Every particle there is is a dipole. That means that the entire core of every atom and everything there is there's a dipole. It's just more of these tiny little bar magnets like this. It's, just, it's virtually identical to this. Instead of one big positive proton, it's one big ball of, of magnets. And each magnet is a muon and an electron neutrino. Now, let's, let's just look at this really quickly. And these are for guys from MIT. Um, it says, more than a century after Ernest Rutherford discovered the positively charged particle at the heart of every atom, physicists are still struggling to fully understand the proton. Well, high school physics teachers describe them as featureless balls with one unit each of positive electric charge. But then when you get to college, college students learn the ball is actually a bundle of three elementary particles. And then when you get further up into the echelons you start looking about leptons and muons and all this business now so now they're going into some people from MIT who I'm trying to contract contact but let me show you what my, I'm saying it is and I'm going to show you what it is when I'm telling you I'm looking back I was a rebel <laughs> they're talking about proton being the most complicated thing in the world I said no it's not complicated it's a dipole and this was when I was dipole, dipole. Everything was dipoles. Transfer of energy is from light to atomic vapor. And atomic vapor is dipoles. Look at here they're talking about Rutherford's atom. I said if energy can have any energy, it can absorb any wavelength and more any distance away from the nucleus. Therefore, Rutherford's atom was wrong. Anyway, and they're talking about it. It's, it's just funny. Because here they are talking about after a hundred years, where is it? Somewhere down here about Rutherford's atom. Hold on one second. Yeah, see, I said Rutherford's atom is wrong. More than a century after Rutherford discovered the positive charge particle at the heart of every atom. It's not positive charge, it's a dipole. Physicists are still struggling to fully understand the proton. It doesn't work. It does not work. That's the problem. All right, I've been posting over and over and over about electron flood theory, the dipoles that reach place the standard model. The nucleus and even the electrons are dipoles. They consist of the particles they can see, and they know that the smallest particles that there are, the muon and electron neutrino. We have separated them and shown that we can make a sterile muon. Nobody else can do that. And, well, they can they see them, but they can't do it on demand. And the electron showers, we show these quite clearly. And that's what I'm going to show in this one. So I did this the other day, and I've done so many of them over and over. I don't want to do a whole other one. So I'm going to add this to that statement about how protons are the most complicated things on Earth. I'm going to show you this. It's not complicated whatsoever. Again, protons, just so you're prepared, po protons are nothing more than dipoles. And there's 1836 of the dipoles. And they become stable as a proton in those periods. That's what's called the periodic table. They're periodic. Every 1836, there seems to be some stability. Okay, so this is um, a Fermi lab, and this is Kirsty Duffy. And again, this is fair use. I'm not stealing anything. I'm commenting on what she is going to say about neutrinos. Because she's asking, how fast do neutrinos travel? That's a question. I have an answer. 
Oh, this is going to be great, my friends. This is from Stanford Libraries. I use copyrighted stuff all the time because I'm doing transformative commenting. What is fair use? Most general use is using copyrighted material for a limited transformative purpose. Commenting, criticizing, parody on copyrighted work. So I have no no barriers against me. I can use it as long as that's what I'm using for. I'm not just taking it. Okay, my outstanding friends, this is my sweet spot. New Trinos. And this is Kirsty Duffy. She's with Fermilab and she's the spokesperson for Even Bananas. And she's t see, Even Bananas have neutrinos. Now, let's see what she has to say about how fast do neutrinos travel and what are neutrinos. I haven't looked at it yet. And I left her a message that I would be commenting on her video. So let's get started. But first, let me show you what they say a neutrino is. And I'll show you, I believe we have found them. And I'd love to be able to discuss this with Fermilab. Okay, these are the neutrinos that they see. One of them is black and one of them is white. And they're attached together. They're called a gluon. And when they hit like heavy water or some other medium, the muon neutrino just turns into a black ball and separates from the electron shower, which turns into a shower of, of particles. But these are the neutrinos, all right? Electron and muon, two of them together. And when they concuss, causing Cherenkov radiation, this is what the division happens, is a shower and a particle. Now, we did that. We created those. I'll show you in a second. And they did do exactly what they say. When they hit the Venturi here, which is just a single slit, the black balls, which are the sterile muons, separated from the electron showers. That is neutrinos. So let's just see what they have to say at Fermilab. See, we're keeping it all under the same roof. This is Fermilab again. These are the particles that they determine exist, the smallest particles. One of them is a fixed size with a glowy edge around it. And one of them is a, no mass at all and is just glowy and can get big and small. And that's precisely what we found. It said, in summary, the extended particle, the black one, is fixed, although they may have a fuzzy edge, and that's the color. The point-like particles are mathematical abstractions, zero size, which I don't agree with that. I say they have a certain size, and it is 0.0435% of mass. 0.0435. So that leaves you 95.65% is the dark matter. And that is the dark matter, whoops, up here, right there. They call it a muon neutrino. And that's what we're talking about, neutrinos, and how fast do they go. And we did accelerate them. All right, these are the particles that, right from the article from Don Lincoln at Fermi Lab. These are the ones that we see, and we see these in black, red, and blue. It doesn't matter. And it's the same black particle every single time. It doesn't change the size, and it separates from the glowy particle when you go through the Venturi because the field crushes it, and it's so tiny, the slit, that only the black, uh, only the white can get through, so the black has to separate. Then they come back together. That's fission, that's fusion. I think we got some capability here. And we know that that's the particle right there. That's accelerating. So how fast do neutrinos go? Well, they accelerate. I can tell you that. That's what they were before, the muon and electron neutrino, muon electron neutrino, but in a photon state. And normally they would just sort of go through the air like normal. But then all of a sudden we accelerate. And that's acceleration. I'll show you normal. Okay, what's coming through the air here is like a two magnets. Back to back, that photon I showed you. And as it comes through the air, this field pushes against every other particle's field. And every particle has a field. So there's no gases, liquids, solids, I don't care what it is. They all have particles, and every particle has a field. So if I have to push that particle out of the way, it's going to glow. The harder I push, the glower it will glow. So all of these are just sort of being 
oofed out of the way. This one's crashing through them. That's why we're glowing here like crazy and these aren't. But that's, the particle is back here somewhere. We're actually probably very close to the front. And it has to push everybody out of the way. That's why you get a field, I mean a wave. And the particles were the one that creates the wave because it's magnetism. All right, I'm going to let Kirsty talk because she's into my area now. She says, why are we talking about photons when we're supposed to be discussing the speed of neutrinos? Photons, right there, are made of electrons. All right, a glowy one and a black one. Nobody ever knew the black one was there. That's the muon neutrino, that's the electron neutrino. That's why we're talking about photons, because everything is made of these two particles. This is the new dipole electron flood theory. It means everything is made of these, which we always call an electron. So everything is made of dipoles. And when you get into the nucleus, you don't have protons like that. You have protons like this. And they seem to be periodically stable at about 1835 or 1836. I, I agree with that. And which makes every electron one, 1,800, one 1,835 or 1,836 of a proton. So there's, there's a ton more particles than they've ever, and it accounts for every, everything. It, it works with quantum, it works with gravity, it works with dark matter. Everything is solved with electron flood theory. So, that's why they're talking about photons when they're talking about neutrinos. <laughs> you, see, you see that face? That's justified because they're talking about if you get to the speed of light, you're, you're, you can see the whole universe at one time, crazy things like that. Now, so she says, what? Think about that for a second. I was in hysterical laughter. Now, but then she said this. What? Think about that for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why are we talking about photons when we're supposed to be discussing the speed of neutrinos? All right, now here it comes. So here I'm looking at things. And what's the matter with you people? Don't you understand? They are the light. They are the light. They are the light. Well, guess what? They're not actually the light until they get accelerated, which is what I thought. But once they get accelerated, they're being pushed back against. So maybe they are slowing down. Here's what she says. There's going, well, listen to this. The short answer is on a practical level, neutrinos travel so close to the speed of light. The short answer is on a practical level, neutrinos travel so close to the speed of light, you can basically just round up. That's so close to the speed of light. Yes. There, well, let me think about it. Let's talk about it. All right, this is the green manifesting, but you see the black and the white the same. Muon electron neutrino, muon electron neutrino make up a photon. Now, something just actually struck me. These had been restricted. Now, are they, maybe they're not actually going completely the full speed of light. Hmm, that's brand new. Just one second ago that occurred to me. Because she's saying there's almost the speed of light. Now, we know back here was faster, I think, than here. Well, I know it is. Now, this is very interesting because I can see that this normally was a wave, just almost a sort of a roundish wave, very similar to that, only a more round. And then as we approach the Venturi, we see the particle being pulled out of the wave. Now, I had assumed, and maybe not right, that this is extreme acceleration, because that's what a Venturi does, it accelerates and atomizes things in liquids, it makes them into atoms, it breaks them into their atom structure almost, and sometimes completely. Now, so I'm assuming that this particle is accelerating like hell. However, it's being obstructed here at the Venturi, and this is what they see when they see the neutrinos. Right about there is when the neutrino is starting to show up. Otherwise, I don't think you see it back here. You don't see the neutrino. I can't find a neutrino in the light. 
But once it accelerates and then it gets pushed back against like a field pushing back at it or two fields colliding together, then is when we see it. So it is, yes, maybe it's going a little slower. But that is brand new, brand spanking new. So that could be a, just a tiniest slowness for that neutrino. Just like she said, they can't, almost can't see it, so they might as well say it's light. Because it started as light just an instant ago. Yes, makes sense. All right, this is just a phenomenal shot. This is light coming in towards the Venturi. You don't really see any light at all, because there's light up in here, too. You don't see it until you get way down here. You start to see a little ripple. But the, directly in line with the Venturi is where the pushback happens strongest. It's like a head-to-head. -head. Basically, this is like head-to-head. -head. Because this is bouncing back head to head, boom, 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 boom. These are sort of pushing away at it, but not anything like this. So they start to show up with a little bit of reactive energy here, and now they start to really pile up against each other. They may be slowing down a little bit. She may be right. And then they divide right there. This is where the division happens, that's the Venturi. But this is the wobble, you see upspin downspin. It's just charged up and flipped, charged up and flipped. And I showed you, well, let me show you one more time so we don't miss a thing. Alright, this changes a lot actually, to be perfectly honest with you. This vibrational push to shove back and forth in the exact focus of the Venturi is identical to hitting exactly head-on like they're trying to do at CERN. All right, they're using the same particles. Everything's made of the same particles, so it doesn't matter. When they hit them exactly head on, they're doing the same thing we are, only we're making them turn around and go back at their own self. It's like AC energy. This changes a little bit. All right, I, uh, a couple little things I've just been thinking about. I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board. and see, cause I've got literally maybe thousands of pictures of different interactions. And... Once you see enough, you can you can draw conclusions, and and I I now need to go back and start to draw some conclusions based on this this push to shove and actually slowing down. It it could be slowing down here. It could be totally right. I thought it was ex accelerating like hell. I'm saying that's not slowing down. That's accelerating. Well, maybe I'm wrong. All right, this is fission and fusion. That's fission, that's fusion. Now, we're using light, so we only had like a little four-banger particle here to start with. Now, will that give us a lot of energy? I'm not certain. Because what they do when they have fission and fusion, they take gigantic, huge things, and when they smash them, they break them into chunks like this. And then those chunks go through water, and they heat it up and all that, or they knock down houses or kill people. And this... What we want to do is just separate them and bring when they come back together, fission and fusion. This looks like a hell of a lot of energy to me. When I see a lot of white, I say, that's energy. That's energy, and it is energy. All right, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I want to do some Zoom meetings. I've been talking about it, and I have a Zoom account. i got one of those Zoom Pro things where you don't have to worry about how much time you spend and so forth. But I don't know how to use it yet. <laughs> Not to, to its full advantage. So, we're going to have some Zoom meetings on this. So, if you know anybody who's a physicist or a scientist of any stripe, we're, I'll, I'll gladly engage on all this because it changes everything. Once you go into the electron flood theory, everything changes, even the periodic chart. The periodic chart's no longer valid because these are made for chunks. Hydrogen is a one big proton. No, it's not. It's one big ball of little particles, which are all dipoles. So that makes hydrogen core a dipole. And the dark matter, the black particles, go to the center. And the white particles surround it. That's why we've never seen the core. All right, so we've got a lot of thinking to do to move into the electron flip, or at least talk about it. If it's wrong, it's wrong, but I think it's right.